discussion afterward. But um, first will be Barbara Stelzel Marx, one of the co-editors of the book. She is a professor of modern history at the University of Graz, and at least as important as the director of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute um, for research on war's consequences, which is based in uh, Graz, Austria. Um, she is uh, combines those two positions and is an expert on um, the post-World War II period, but has also written about the pre-war period. Um, her predecessor as director of the Boltzmann Institute is the other co-editor, uh, Stefan Karner, who is also here today. He, he is currently a professor of modern history at the, uh, at the University of Graz, but is um, the founding director of the Boltzmann Institute. Um, my Cold War Studies program has had very close ties over the years with that uh, Boltzmann, um, Boltzmann Institute. And I'm very pleased to have them here. Um, a third panelist is Balta Eber, who is over, um, who is uh, also at the University of Graz, a professor of economic history there. He, um, in the book, contributed a chapter that looked at some of the economic dimensions of Austria's relationship to it, the Soviet Union during this period, how it changed. Um, the fourth panelist is, as I mentioned, is Vladimir Prochatnev, who is a professor of modern history at um, the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, which is a university in, um, in Moscow that um, is, one of, is essentially the premier school for people who want to go into international affairs, either in diplomacy or in business or in um, academia. And so um, I'm very pleased to have Vladimir here as well. With that, let me turn to Barbara first. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, dear Mark, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much, Mark, for the uh, possibility to have this webinar on the Red Army in Austria today. A huge topic. Uh, we will uh, we will focus just on a, on a couple of uh, themes. I would also like to thank uh, Peter Ruppenthaler, the uh, Vice Director at the Boltzmann Institute uh, here in Graz in Austria for helping uh, in organizing uh, this webinar. Um, yeah, March 29th, 1945. Uh, this was when uh, the first Red Army soldiers crossed the border between Hungary and Austria, Austria that was then part of the Third Reich. This marked the beginning of the liberation of Austria and also the beginning of the occupation that was to last for 10 years, as Mark, uh, Mark has mentioned. Uh, the Red Army soldiers, and it was a, a large group, 400,000 Red Army soldiers who entered Austrian territory um, at, the, um, at the end of the war in 1945. They entered a hostile and unknown world that did not really greet the liberator from fascism uh, with open arms. And at the same time, it meant uh, that the, the Red Army soldiers came into contact with a capitalist Western society for the first time in their lives and in most cases also for the last time, at least for many, many decades uh, to come. In some cases, this also meant a cultural shock and the polit officers of the Red Army were very busy uh, convincing or trying to convince the Red Army soldiers of the um, uh, advantages of the communist uh, system. And in many cases, uh, they did not really succeed. Here you can see uh, a sign Aust Austria, uh, Austria written uh, in Cyrillic letters. Of course, this was a propaganda photograph by Yevgeny uh, Khalday. Uh, let me just give you a couple of, uh, of numbers of background information uh, to give you an idea what the situation was like. Austria was divided into four zones of occupation, as you can see here. Uh, in fact, in the context of the 
uh, of the Cold War, uh, it was divided basically into two zones, uh, the Western zone of occupation, uh, in American, the British, the French zone, uh, and the, the Soviet zone, uh, UDSSR, in the Eastern part uh, of Austria. Uh, what is quite unique and also a big difference to the situation in Berlin uh, is that the, the that Vienna, uh, the first district of uh, Vienna, was administered by all four occupying forces together. And here you see the famous photograph, the four in the jeep, uh, this picture of the inter-allied military police uh, in, in Vienna which shows us that there were uh, various ways of uh, direct interaction uh, between uh, the allied forces uh, on a personal level, but also in the administration, for example, uh, through the allied council. And not surprisingly, and that's something I talk about a bit later, uh, Vienna uh, in, in particular, but Austria in general, developed into a hotspot for espionage in the evolving uh, Cold War. Um, what I'd like to do now is to focus on two topics that show in the context of, of the Cold War, uh, the, uh, the influence of the macro history on the micro history, the macro history of the, of the situation of the Cold War on the micro history. First of all, uh, the personal relationships uh, between Red Army soldiers and local women, which is Austrian uh, women. Uh, we found a document in the Moscow archives from July 1945 uh, saying an order that was issued by the political uh, department of the NKVD that actually warned the Red Army soldiers of getting into close contact with Western women so one might ask, why was that? Literally, uh, this, this uh, uh, document says that relationships were politically and ideologically dangerous. The men concerned were regarded as morally unstable and the women were considered as a high risk factor, bewitched so, uh, and enchanting uh, the Red Army soldiers in order to betray military and state secrets. So uh, in the context of the developing Cold War, uh, these relationships were regarded as a high risk uh, factor to, to the Red Army, uh, which also shows us the Red Army was a political army. Their behavior, the behavior of the soldiers was always seen in the political context. This is true for Austrian interior affairs this is also true uh, for wider, for the wider international context. Um, as a result, of course, uh, weddings, for example, were not allowed. And when love affairs became known to the superiors, uh, the, uh, the Red Army soldiers were often sent back to the Soviet Union or uh, to another stationing location, which meant the end of contact for many decades. Another issue uh, that must be mentioned uh, in this context is uh, the issue of, of rape uh, that took place particularly um, at, the, at the time of the end of the war, April, May uh, 1945. And this was not only regarded, uh, as we know from the Soviet documents, as a risk uh, for the discipline in the troops, but also in the political context as it influenced uh, the, the mood of the population. Like in Austria, for example, the, the first free elections after the war in November 1945 resulted in a very bad result for the uh, Austrian Communist Party that gained only about 5% uh, of all the votes. Uh, as a result of this whole variety of personal relationships, um, thousands, tens of thousands of children of occupation were born in Austria, also, of course, in, in Germany. And this shows us how very much the macro history influenced the very personal biographies, the very personal lives, the micro history of the people concerned. Because 
almost 100% of the Soviet uh, children of occupation grew up as, as a fatherless generation. Um, and even if they wanted to have personal contact with the fathers due to the Cold War after, also after 1955, it was almost impossible to get uh, into touch uh, with relatives in, in the Soviet uh, Union up to Perestroika. Another issue that I would like to mention uh, in, in this uh, context, secondly, is the issue of espionage, espionage uh, in Austria, this country that was occupied by the four occupying forces. Uh, and here again, we see how the macro history, the situation uh, in general, affected the lives of the local population. There were about 2,000 um, uh, Austrians who were arrested by the uh, by Soviet forces and were sentenced uh, and sent to the Soviet Gulag. And in some cases, in about 100 cases, between 1950 and 1953, they were also sentenced to death and shot dead uh, in Moscow. But something that we come about uh, only we came about only a couple of years ago when the, uh, the files became available in the state archives uh, in Moscow. So, what were the reasons for for arrest? What were the reasons for these uh, rather harsh uh, sentences? Uh, war crimes on the one hand side. Also things like poisoning Red Army soldiers with bad or poisonous alcohol, illegal gun ownership, and particularly uh, with the years to come, anti-Soviet espionage. Anti-Soviet espionage um, for, for, the, for Western services, secret services, particularly American and, and British ones. Um, the men who were involved, and here you can see one of them, Leo Talhammer, who was shot dead in Moscow in 1951 for passing on information on trains uh, that were going uh, to, to, to Hungary. Uh, they, were, they cannot be compared to James Bond and also the women uh, who were arrested uh, and sentenced uh, because of anti-Soviet espionage uh, were not like Marta Hari, so to say but they were completely ordinary people who passed on some information, for example, on the Soviet troops in Austria, on trains uh, going east or on the Soviet economy, something that my colleague uh, Walter Eber will talk about more later on. So in fact, from today's point of view, it was easily accessible information, but in the context of the Cold War, it was a part of, of this a jigsaw uh, of information that the Western uh, secret services were collecting and were putting uh, together. And those about 2000 Austrians and particularly those about 100 who were shot dead uh, in Moscow, they had no idea that in passing on this kind of information, uh, in collaborating to a certain extent with Western secret services, they were actually uh, putting their lives on, on risk. And uh, one interesting detail in this context is that uh, uh, that is also linked to the issue I mentioned before, uh, linked to the Kremlin's assessment of personal relationships that half, 50%, so half of the women who were uh, sentenced to death and shot dead in Moscow had had a personal love affair, personal, a love affair, personal relationship uh, with a Soviet uh, Red Army officer. So in these cases, the honey trap, so to say, snapped fatally uh, for them. In 1955, the state treaty was signed. And uh, after 10 years of occupation, uh, the occupation uh, ended two years after Stalin's death in 1953. By October 19, uh, October the 26th, uh, 1955, uh, the last um, occupying soldier had left uh, the country. Here you can see this, this picture, painful farewell 1955, um, which meant that Austria was finally liberated from its liberators and was free, which is a quote 
from a contemporary Austrian document. The consequences of the confrontation of macro and micro history in the Cold War in Austria are perceptible until today. Thank you very much. Very, very good. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you very much for sticking to the time. Um, I am now going to, uh, if you could um, stop sharing the screen here, and then um, I will turn next to Stefan Karner. And uh, you, Stefan, you'll have to unmute here. Let me see if I can do it. Um, no, as Stefan, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. Someone's coming to help. <laughs> Assistance. Okay. okay. Stefan, please. <laughs> Fine. It's going on? Yes. Thank you, yes. Mark, for our many years cooperation in, in, in many projects. And thank you for the possibility to present our new book here, here in, in, in your, at, at your university. Uh, after the overview of uh, Barbara, I want to add only some words on the deportations from the federal state of Styria, a small part of Austria, uh, by Soviet organs in uh, 45. So the Red Army is considered as a topos for the Soviet occupation policy in the country from 45 to 55, the year of the Austrian State Treaty and the withdrawal of the Allied occupiers of Americans, of British, French, and Soviets. On March uh, 29, uh, in 45, uh, as uh, Barbara said, the Red Army had invaded Eastern Austria and liberated the con conquered territories from Nazism. By the end of the war, the Red Army had occupied approximately half of Austria and brought it under its uh, administration. The Western and Southern territories were occupied by the other Western Allied troops. Plus, I have to add it, plus the Bulgarian troops and the Tito partisans. In total, about 400 Red Army soldiers came to Austria in 45. 270,000 of them received the award for the capture of Vienna. 26,000 of them fell in the fighting in the eastern part of Austria and in Vienna as well. 10 years later, in uh, 55, where uh, there were still about uh, approximately uh, 40,000 Red Army soldiers in Austria, plus about 10,000 civilians. Soviet occupation policy toward Austria was complex and characterized about all. Firstly, by the establishment of a state government under uh, Karl Renner, our first president. Secondly, by the dismantling of hundreds of industrial plants and enterprises and uh, their transfer to the USSR. Uh, Walter Eva will, uh, will then uh, speak about it. Thirdly, by the takeover of former German property and the establishment of a strong Soviet economy body, the USIA, USIA in, in, in Russian, which produced ex exclusively for the Soviet Union. By the, and by the significant, significant food donations for the starving population of Vienna, and at least by a relatively frictionless cooperation in the Allied Council with the other occupying powers. This cooperation was facilitated by the established joint allied administration of the inner city of Vienna. Uh, something uh, that did not exist in Berlin, for example. In addition, there was the possibility of using Austria as a platform, so to say, a platform for and uh, as a mediator in the struggle between East and West during the Cold War. Two characteristics remained firmly in the collective memory of the Austrians, which also had a lasting impact on their image of the Russians. The 
proverbial love of children of the Red Army soldiers and the hundreds of thousands of lootings and assaults of women by Soviet soldiers, especially in the first months after the war. The daily uncertainty and fear of something unpredictable therefore meant for many not a feeling of liberation, but of occupations. This includes, in particular, the thousands of arrests of former policemen, Nazi intelligence officers, war criminals, Nazi functionaries, the forced repatriation of former Soviet emigrants, of Vlasov and Cossack units, but also the deportations of civilians, often on the basis of denunciations by their neighbors. From the federal state of Styria alone, 130 people were very, uh, very fiber, uh, abducted within three months. A US report suspected the number to be as high as 500 already in August 45. In the Soviet occupation zone, the number was uh, in the thousands over a period of 10 years. Many of them were executed as American spies, the last in 52, 53. Among the best known deportees, deportees were policemen Kiridus and Marek and the Republic's most powerful official, Margaret Ottilinger. The two policemen had set up a band, Austrian intelligence service with the help of the Americans. Ottilinger had opposed, opposed Soviet economy, uh, opposed Soviet maybe econ economics intentions and cooperated in part with US authorities. Marek, uh, Kiridus and Dottilinger were sentenced to 25 years imprisonment uh, and gulag camps, but were able to uh, return home after the signing of the state treaty in 55. The situation was different for the approximately 50,000 of Cossacks. I want to use the possibility of this lecture to give a short spot on fate of these Cossacks. In the last days of World War II, they came into the southern part of Austria via the Balkans and the northern part of Italy. In the Balkan lands, especially in Croatia, their, mil their military units were particularly involved in some war criminals. Here in Eastern Tyrol and in Carinthia, as to say in, in, in the southern part of Austria, they were a few days after the end of the war and secondly, against any international law of war, disarmed by the British troops in May 45 and handed over under duress to the Soviet organs in Western Styria. Among the Cossacks were, as I said, military units such as the 15 Cossack Cavalry Corps, but also thousands of women, children, and elderly people who had followed the troops across Ukraine, the Balkans, and uh, Upper Italy. The youngest child, her, her name was Romana, had already been born in Italy. They knew what fate awaited them, death, forced labor, exile, and decades of repression. Out of the desperation, hundreds took their own lives during the handover. Now I want to make a full stop. This is what we have no what the, this is what we know until now, uh, especially from the British historian Nikolai uh, Tolstoy. 
in the Moscow military archive, I was able to find Soviet documents now about their further fate for the first time. On one list, there were 888 Cossacks. 268 of them were women who were deported to Kemerovo in central Siberia. Here in, uh, in Siberia, in camp 525, nine of the NKVD, they were subjected to political and physical selection, so uh, so-called filtration and forced and, and, and forced labor. Of the 808 Cossacks, more than half were younger than 21 year and 15 percent were under five years old or were some or were babies. How many of them survived the camp is unknown, unknown so far. My research for this book, which for the first time was able to shed light on the treatment of the Cossack after their deportation on the basis of Soviet records, was now led to a new research project in Novosibirsk, dealing with the fate of the Cossack people in the Soviet camps in Siberia. One thing is clear. It was only on January 1st in 1995, 50 years after the end of the war, that President Boris Yeltsin lifted the administrative repression against the so-called traitors to the fatherland. By the time, of course, many of them were not, were no longer alive. So the research project to this new books, Red Army in Austria, brings up a lot of new views on the topic around the Red Army. The Red Army in Austria, regardless of the fact that this is the first book in English on this subject. I thank all to you who made this work possible. The Russian archives, the authors, my friend Mark Kramer, my co-editor -ed Barbara, and last but not least, the publisher Lexington Books. Lexington Books. Thank you for your attention. Very good. Thanks a lot, Stefan. And thank you too for being very disciplined about the time. Um, let me turn next to Walter Ibra. Um, Okay, first of all, um, Mark, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to the uh, Davis Center. I now come to my uh, topic. This is um, Soviet economic policy toward Austria from 1945 till 1955, 1963, um, occupation and exploitation. Uh, the Soviet Union, had suffered the most damage from the Second World War. So after the end of the war, it focused its attention on compensating these damages in the territories it occupied. As well, as well known, this included Austria. Through their planning and intelligence departments, the Soviets had learned during the war that Austrian economy had played an important role in German uh, armaments, uh, construction industry, iron and steel industry, mechanical engineering, and above all, the oil industry in the east of the country. At the end of the war, Austrian oil production was the third largest in Europe after the USSR and after uh, Romania. Immediately after the end of the war, there was uncontrolled plundering then, as in other countries too, dismantling of industrial plants, machinery, equipment. Uh, 220 factories were completely or partially dismantled by order of the State Defense Committee, so-called abbreviated GOKO. GOKO. See this uh, table, this is my first slide. So you have a comparison with uh, other states. The equipment, according to the plan, was taken to the Soviet Union. 
I will give you an example. In Sankt Marijn, Upper Styria, the most modern steel mill in Europe at the time had gone, had only gone into operation in 1944. Minister of Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, had opened it personally. It was now 1945, completely dismantled. What benefit the Soviet Union was able to derive overall from the dismantling is still disputed today. There seem to have been many technical, uh, technical and logistical problems during dismantling as well as during uh, the transport. The Potsdam resolutions of August 1945 then led to a gradual change in strategy. No longer was there just dismantling and removal, but economic resources were managed on site. In other words, an occupation economy. For this purpose, the Soviets made general use of so-called German property. The victorious powers had awarded this property to each other in Potsdam, depending on the occupation soon as reparations, so to speak. With regard to Austria, this was an uh, elegant solution for the Soviets. Under international law, no reparations could be dem demanded from Austria. It had not been a sovereign state during the war and thus not a participant in the war. Now Moscow was accessing the German foreign property or foreign assets in the country. Officially, these were German reparations. But from Austria's point of view, there were two major problems here. First of all, there was more German foreign property in Austria than in any other country in the world. This was a result of the massive economic expansion after the Anschluss in 1938. See this um, elaboration from Soviet sources, my second slide, so that you can imagine the conditions compared to other states. The second point, Austrian, original Austrian assets, uh, that means assets from before 1938, could in many cases no longer be distinguished from German assets. For the Soviet Union, only one question remains. How should exploitation be organized? First of all, the occupying power tried it in the field of petroleum management by establishing, establishing a joint venture called Sanafta. Sanafta was to be a cooperative venture between the occupiers, Soviet Union, and the occupied, Austria, similar in principle to the Sovroms in Romania, Sovrom Petrol. The Soviets would have contributed all German petroleum assets to the company while the Austrian, Austrians would have been responsible for the necessary capitalization. The project was negotiated in summer of 1945. It uh, failed because of the veto of the Western powers, which in turn represented the interests of their own oil companies in Austria. The Soviet Union then decided to establish its own extraterritorial administrations. German property was uh, consolidated and exploited under the umbrella of these administrations. The beginning was made by separate administration for the petroleum industry, the Soviet Mineral Oil Administration in German, Sovietische Mineralölverwaltung, abbreviated SMV. SMV was founded in September 1945. As early as October 2, Colonel Konstantin Rabinin, the first SMV general director, announced the seizure of the German oil companies in Eastern Austria in accordance with the Potsdam Agreement. In the first time, SMV's capital included um, drilling or production companies, natural gas companies, distribution sales companies, refineries, and um, an oil terminal. By the summer of 1947, this asset base had been further expanded to additional confiscations. SMV leased the, the confiscated assets of the German distribution companies, including more than 300 uh, service uh, stations, to the company Orop, which had been founded in the fall of 1946 and held a monopoly position in the mineral oil distribution sector in the Soviet occupation soon. In September 1949, SMV discovered the largest contiguous oil fields in Central Europe at the time in Matzen, Auerstal. See the map, my third slide um, of uh, SMV's oil fields in uh, Lower Austria. In 1955, the Soviets 
handed over the oil operations to the Republic of Austria on the basis of the Moscow Memorandum, which was negotiated one month before the state treaty. In the almost 10 years of its existence, um, SMV produced nearly 18 million tons of crude oil. A large part of this, around 60%, was shipped out of the country, bypassing taxes and custom duties. It went to the refineries of the Eastern Europe satellite states because of its high quality Austrian oil was in great demand there. The second big administration was the, um, as Stefan mentioned, USIA, administration of Soviet property in Austria. Uh, the foundation of the USIA was based on the decision of the Council of Ministers of the USSR on March 28, 1946, with the order of uh, number 17 of the Soviet Commander-in-Chief in Austria, General Kurasov. The implementation followed, and refer referring to the Potsdam decisions, the order published on July 5, 1946, but dated June 27, 1946, decreed the transfer of all German assets located in Eastern Austria to the ownership of uh, Soviet Union. By predating the order, the Soviets uh, preempted Austria's nationalization of the enterprises. In addition to the central office, the USIA was divided into eight subdivisions for the administration of the individual economic sectors, similar to the joint stock companies in East Germany, Sovjetische Aktiengesellschaften. At the time of its establishment, the USIA took under its administration a total of 436 enterprises, industrial, agricultural, forestry, commercial, and so on, and more than 3,000 uh, real estates. Entrance portals of the enterprises um, were usually emblazoned with red Soviet stars. See the photo above on the next um, slide. The photo of an USIA betrieb this uh, 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 Fabrik in Lower Austria. The number of USIA companies varied greatly in the following years, as there was repeated, sometimes temporary uh, closures and mergers, mostly because of massive economic problems. In any case, according to Soviet figures, um, 213 USIA plants were handed over to Austria in 1955. In addition, there was formerly a third administration, the parts of the Danube Steam Navigation Company, DDSG, confiscated by the Soviets, uh, which included, for example, the shipyard in Konoiburg, also uh, Lower Austria. The DDSG was legally independent, but um, organizationally run as a subdivision of the USIA. See my illustration below, ships, DDSG ships with uh, Kyrillic letters. These um, administrations together, SMV, USIA, DDSG, uh, meanwhile employed more than 60,000 people, most of them uh, Austrian workers. In 1955, the Soviet companies were in a poor economic position. In the meantime, they had generated high profits, but from 1952 onward, things went steeply downhill. Years of Soviet planned economy had left their mark, and we know from internal Soviet documents that they wanted to get rid of the companies quickly and sell them to Austria. During the final bilateral negotiations in this, on the state treaty in Moscow, the following treat was made. Soviet troops were to be uh, withdrawn from Austria, but the Soviet enterprises were to remain. Moscow would uh, thus have remained present in the country, and the Austrian delegation wanted to prevent this by all means. It therefore undertook to buy the factories at exorbitant prices. They were supposed to pay 10 million tons of oil for the SMV, but according to internal calculations of the Politburo, it was worth only 4 million tons of oil. Later, the Austrians renegotiated here and were able to reduce the deliveries to 6 million tons. This corresponded to a dollar value of 100 million. For the USIA, $150 million were paid, 
a value that had already been agreed upon in 1949, but then the plants had been at the peak of their profitability. Now they were worth only about $80 million. The Austrians were prepared to pay this price. It was a political price aimed at finally achieving the complete withdrawal of the Soviets. The obligations were settled by 1963. Um, I have already mentioned it. On, one should not speak of reparations in this case of Austria, rather of reparation equivalent benefits. Uh, these benefits consisted of, see my next and my last table, uh, the dismantlings I mentioned, the reparations from current production. That means the profits of UCI and SMV, a large part of which 40% consisted of unpaid, unpaid taxes. The aforementioned payments in connection with the uh, state treaty, to which other smaller payments were added, for example, for the DDSG. Thus, the total reparations to the Soviet Union amounted, amounted to $1 billion at 1955 prices. This was about as much as Austria received in economic aid to the Marshall Plan. Furthermore, Austria still had to pay the occupation costs almost half a billion dollars. Austria's total payments to the Soviet Union thus amounted to $1.4 billion uh, dollars in 1955. Finally, I would like to emphasize one thing. The systematic economic exploitation by the Soviets did cause great material damage. Nevertheless, Austria was lucky. In other occupied countries, Moscow, intervened much more strongly in politics and society. It shaped them into communist dictatorships. This did not happen in Austria. Influence here remained essentially limited to economic exploitation policies. Thank you for the attention. Thanks, thanks very much, Malta. Very interesting comparative data there. I'm especially curious, I have to admit, about Manchuria. Um, but anyway, we will uh, come back to that undoubtedly. There are numerous questions that have already accumulated and one of them does deal, not with Manchuria, but with other aspects of the economic dimension. But now let me turn to Vladimir Pichatna. Vladimir. Can you hear me well? Well, yes, you're fine, Vladimir. Mark, and dear friends and colleagues, it's good to see everyone. Uh, all right. I'm very thankful for your invitation, but <clears throat> frankly, I feel a bit awkward in this uh, role of mine to, on Soviet policy in Austria. Uh, I haven't done any original research in this specific field. So um, let me just share my impressions of this volume of these presentations and some ideas which were provoked by them for whatever they may be worth. Uh, uh, this volume, of course, is a product, is a culmination of many years of research by Boltzmann Institute, as Mark suggested, and its uh, collaborators, both in Russia and other countries, led by originally Stefan Karner and now by Barbara Steltz, um, it's also an international uh, archival research project. Based, there is Austria-Russian Historical Commission. There is a strong input from the Russian uh, archives and researchers. I myself took part in some of those events, and I have nothing but praise for our Austrian colleagues' hospitality, effectiveness, and goodwill. The result of this huge effort is before our eyes. One of the least researched chapters in the Cold War history became one of the best researched. Uh, and um, this, let me just talk specifically about the content of this volume. And I think it's very, it's very good that it's finally available in English that will surely expand its audience in many countries. Um, 
the volume is not simply a collection of separate essays, but it's a rather well-structured and integral piece of research embracing the main aspects of Soviet policies in Austria during the period of occupation, political, economic, military, intelligence, and even social. My main focus is a general pattern of Soviet policies in Austria as a part of Soviet Cold War strategy and policies. While there are some uh, differences in emphasis and interpretation, there seems to be a sort of general consensus among the authors of this volume about the main motives and calculations behind the Soviet policy in Austria. First of all, this policy is seen as fairly rational and con contingent and limited in its scope, driven not so much by ideology, but rather by a complex mix of tangible strategic, economic, and political interests. It's rational, of course, in the Soviet framework of reference. But for that matter, all rationalities tends to be uh, conditioned by some other factors. Uh, second, I think this volume demonstrates that this Soviet policy was not static, but evolving, adapting to the changing circumstances and environment. Correspondingly, the Soviet calculations were also changing, leading to policy changes. Yet, there were some certain constant, um, constantly operating factors uh, that ran through the whole period. Let me just name them. First of all, recognition of Austria, Austria's independence. I would remind our general audience that the song from the Moscow Declaration of 1943. A second, it was a rejection of, its, of the Sovietization option, which some of the speakers have, have referred already to. Third, it was working through uh, Austria's government while keeping some distance from the local communists. And finally, it was maintaining a light control mechanism instead of breaking it. Uh, the Soviet occupation policy was harsh, and even brutal, as we saw in presentations today. But it could have been much more unilateralist and even worse. For instance, American and British representatives in Austria were really worried that the Soviet side in Eastern uh, Austria was so preponderant that it was capable of, a more, of more drastic measures like instigating terror in the Soviet control enterprises that Walter has described in his presentation. Um, alienating the Soviet zone from the administrative control of the Allied government, physical terror against Austrian government, and even partitioning of Austria, setting up a sort of an iron curtain between the eastern part of the country and the rest of it. So by the way, American and British observers uh, were very keen analysis, uh, analysts of the situation and of the Soviet policy in Austria. And their reporting, in my view, might be more widely used in, in your research in the future. What were, the, were some of the uh, questions I think I, I see already in chat? And some people are asking about this for this relative. There is Soviet moderation in Austria, which makes it different from some other places, from actually from most of other countries in Europe occupied by the Soviet army. Uh, those reasons were many, as it's shown in the book. It was uh, Austria's secondary importance in the Soviet priorities, the weakness of the local communists, and a fairly strong resistance of Austrian society to the Soviet control, a skillful policy of Austria's government, beginning with Renner's government in 45, which knew how to defend its independence without antagonizing the Soviets too much. 
At the same time as Peter Rubenthaler and Stefan Karner show it in their chapters, the Soviets were not interested in the early withdrawal from Austria and dragged their feet in the negotiations. The controlling factors here were economic interests, providing rationale for keeping Soviet troops in Hungary and Romania until their complete Sovietization, keeping Soviet presence in Austria as a buying chip in the German settlement, and the fear of a chain reaction in Germany and Eastern Europe if such withdrawal takes place. But by the early 50s, these calculations began to change. Economic gains were diminishing. Partition of Germany and consolidation of Soviet control over Eastern Europe weakened the Soviet concern with the negative repercussions of the withdrawal within the Soviet bloc. Still, it took the change of leadership in Kremlin, Stalin's death, and coming of the collective leadership, so so-called, uh, in uh, to translate these new calculations into practical policies, and I think Mikhail Prozomenshika from Russia in his chapter provides a very good evidence of that internal struggle within the Soviet leadership. Uh, this new accommodation line toward Austria was also in tune with a new emphasis on peaceful coexistence and improved relations with Yugoslavia and Finland and the spirit of Geneva of 1955. But even then, Vyacheslav Molotov, who came back to power in charge of Soviet foreign policy, played again a delaying game, trying to tie the state treaty to preventing Germany's entry into European defense community. So it was the failure of this attempt and Germany joining NATO, combined with setting up of the Warsaw Pact in 55, which provided a new rationale for the Soviet military presence in Germany and Central Europe, that finally cleared the ground for the state treaty of 55. So this is my reading of the basic uh, content of the, uh, in terms of analysis of Soviet policies and um, I, I must admit that it's very close to my own understanding. So my question, it's, it's also close to what uh, our colleague from the United States, uh, Norman Neymark, uh, wrote in his chapter on Austria in his new book, uh, which came out recently. So my question, uh, my questions to the authors present here is, first of all, how correct is my uh, interpretation of your your conclusions and then how uh, do you have any serious disagreements with uh, Norman not Neymark's analysis uh, in his in, in his work um, there are also two very substantial chapters in the book uh, one on Soviet economic policy and the other on Soviet intelligence uh, um, Walter Re Eber uh, described his uh, chapter, I think, very well. Let me just add that it uh, provides a comprehensive picture of Soviet economic interests and ways of pursuing them. Among other things, it shows diminishing returns of this policy. Cost of benefits analysis based on rich statistics uh, and archival sources from Russia. Uh, I think Walter didn't mention it, but in his conclusion in his chapter in the book, uh, of course, he, emph he emphasizes the economic burden of the occupation, the hidden reparations, he called them. Uh, but at the same time, he also mentioned the unintended benefits uh, of this uh, economic exploitation, like uh, con uh, which contributed somewhat to reorganization of uh, Austrian industry and laid some ground for the future trade and economic ties of Austria with the Soviet Union and the Socialist Bloc. The chapter on Soviet intelligence, which, had, which we haven't discussed today, is very strong on the organization and structure of the intelligence operations. Some of those operations were rather inventive, as I discovered reading the book. 
like uh, recruiting brothel owners for monitoring uh, the clients from the allied military personnel. Uh, but as the author admits himself, there is not enough evidence yet available about uh, content of those operations and the information they provided. The Russian security archives still keep the sec many of, the, of their secrets closed. Um, little more is known about the Western intelligence operations in Austria. And it would be interesting to compare in the future research those operations with the Soviet ones, since as uh, uh, it's rightly emphasized in the book, the Austria was a battleground of the Cold War also in terms of intelligence and, and the intelligence um, competition. I'm also curious about whether any documentary evidence is available in Austria's security archives about Austrian counterintelligence counter operations against Soviet agents. That would give a, a, another interesting dimension to this analysis. A very interesting and very informative chapter deals with the Soviet judiciary in Austria, Soviet justice and sentencing. While both Barbara and Stefan uh, spoke about this already, um, it's uh, in, in the book, it's very well researched with lots of details and statistics down to the level of single individuals. Um, understandably, the emphasis is on the injustice, brutality and overkill of the Soviet repressions. At the same time, the authors admit but don't play those instances when that punishment was justified. And there were cases of this sort as well. On reparations, very interesting to examine the human experience of Austrian prisoners of war and other repatriants in the Soviet Union. There must be some uh, oral history collections about this. But perhaps this research has been done already, and I'm simply not aware of its existence. But it would be interesting to, to know more about this. Well, the most disturbing and emotionally charged part for me was Barbara Stelt's uh, concluding chapter on Ivan's children. It's a tragic story, which we knew in general terms, but here, thanks to her work, uh, we are given not just the facts and figures, but the human side of this, she calls it micro history, micro history. And that human side still exists, even extending to the current, to the current times. Um, Barbara provides a very subtle, and I would say critical, analysis of the Austrian public attitude towards those children, the attitude was, which was shaped by different factors, German Nazi propaganda, and Slavic and anti-Soviet feelings among the populace, and so forth. And she treats the most sensitive sexual abuse problem very even-handedly, explaining the environment and motivations on both sides. I, for one, would not defend the behavior of Soviet troops in Austria and some other countries in Europe. I would only make a more pronounced differentiation between official Soviet policy and everyday behavior of the troops. The Soviet authorities in Austria, as well as in other countries, understood the problem and its negative effect on the local population and their attitude toward the Soviet Union. Some of the more violent um, offenders were executed. Often they faced firing squad to make it a demonstration for their comrades. But the problem lies deeper. It's more cultural than political. The Soviet military abused even, though, even their own compatriots whom they liberated from the camps. And there are some, I would say, 
soul tearing documents about this, some of them published in Russia. Um, it's also a personal story for my family. Uh, my uh, aunt in law was uh, a nurse at the front during the war because she has medical training. She was wounded and taken prisoners by the Germans. They put her in, into the concentration camp where she continued to work as a nurse. Then, when she was liberated, uh, it was considered to be a collaboration with the enemy. So she went directly from the concentration camp in Germany to the Soviet camp, where she said she was more abused than in the German one. It was almost by miracle that my father-in-law managed to rescue, to rescue his sister from, from that awful place. So the root of the matter here is an element of brutality, deeply ingrained in Russian and Soviet culture. Lack of respect for human dignity and for human life in the culture where life was always worth a copic, as the Russian saying goes. Um, but brutality, especially during the war times, was not limited to the Soviet side. There were many war crimes committed by Germans, and let's face it, Austrians too, on the Soviet territory. So while holding others responsible, we shouldn't forget about our own sins. It's, it's a no way reproach to Barbara, which as I said, uh, is quite balanced in her analysis and tries to avoid moral judgment. Finally, this professional very powerful volume provides a rather green and gloomy picture of the Soviet occupation in Austria. It's understandable because such was the reality of this occupation and also because the authors concentrated on blanks, blank spots of uh, this policies and its history. It's dark chapters which previously had been silenced or ignored. And yet I wonder if some other less gloomy and more benign aspects of this policy deserve more attention. Things like humanitarian assistance uh, from this provided by the Soviet side. And there was something done along these lines. Soviet propaganda and cultural diplomacy in Austria. Finally, human contacts that couldn't be reduced only to abuse and exploitation. But this may be a parochial Russian view, uh, and you are free, of course, to, to disregard it, but I still felt that I have to express it here. But otherwise, I'm very thankful for the work you've done, and I'm taking my hat uh, to my colleagues, both Austrian, German, and, and the Russians, for making this work possible. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. Uh, excellent commentary on other parts of the book that we won't have time to explore in depth today. But, um, but certainly, I would encourage anyone who wants to um, explore the important topics that um, Vladimir raised. Once again, here is the book. Uh, there was someone in the questions who asked specifically about how to order it. This book you can find on uh, Amazon.com or on the Roman and Littlefield website. Um, there are numerous ways to order it. You can contact the Cold War Studies uh, at Harvard, which um, has, has various ways of ordering the books in the series. So um, the, um, there is no shortage of ways to order it. I would encourage people to do so. Um, with that, let me, there are many questions that have accumulated. So let me, um, some of these it's fairly easy to direct to uh, specific panelists, but others um, will be a bit harder. Let me start by just, um, there are three that all deal with the earlier period in the occupation. Um, actually, one of them even precedes that, which has to do with uh, from Howard Madsen asks, 
um, from the Anschluss uh, with Germany to the end of World War II, did Austria have an organized anti-Nazi resistance of the Suet that existed in other European countries? Um, so I, before anyone deals with that, we did, there's, that can be dealt with fairly quickly. But there are other questions that will require somewhat greater explication. Let me, let me bring up two others um, since we to ensure time that we have adequate time is um, uh, one of these is very clearly, I think, for Barbara, um, which is why were Austrians taken all the way back to Moscow to be executed? Couldn't they have been put to death right on the spot in the Soviet zone in Austria? Um, and another, which uh, also deals with the nature of the occupation has to do and, and adds a comparative dimension. This is from Tim Dingeman. Um, how did the Soviet army sort out the prisoners of war after the war and carry out denazification? And how uh, was what was done in the Soviet zone, how did that compare with the other occupation zones, the US, British, French zones um, on both of those points, the uh, sweating of prisoners and the denazification. So please, we'll start with those three questions. Let me turn first to Barbara because there's one I think that is specifically for her. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. And thank you very much, Vladimir, uh, for this uh, very, very good and uh, and precise uh, comment uh, and, and actually summary of, of our work of our book, uh, The Red Army in Austria. Uh, I absolutely agree with what you summarized, uh, Vladimir. And thank you also um, for, uh, for this good feedback uh, that you have given. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the various questions we have received. Uh, let me just quickly start with resistance. Yes, of course, uh, there was uh, anti-Nazi resistance uh, in Austria, uh, also particularly uh, at the end of the war when uh, there was a group around, uh, uh, around Major Karl Sokol uh, that uh, collaborated uh, with the Red Army and uh, tried to prevent a severe destruction uh, of Vienna and just a couple of days actually before the liberation of Vienna on, on April the 13th, 1945, uh, three uh, members of this uh, resistance uh, group were, uh, were publicly hanged uh, in, in Vienna. So yes, uh, a quick answer, yes, there, there was resistance. Uh, the other question was, uh, and I may, may um, uh, also uh, comment on this, why were those people uh, sentenced, sentenced to death, but in general sentence taken to the Soviet Union, why uh, were they not executed uh, in Austria? I think the main reason is that the, uh, the, the Stalinist, uh, the Soviet system tried to hide up what they were doing. Everything was kept secretly. There was no communication at all on what was going on uh, behind the prison walls, uh, for example, in Baden near Vienna, where, uh, where all the, uh, the questioning and, and the um, sentences and so on uh, was taking place. And I think that's also the main reason why uh, those sentenced to death were taken to, to Moscow, where they were kept in a prison uh, in, in, in Moscow then uh, uh, shot dead and, and uh, then they were buried uh, uh, on, on the cemetery, um, the Donskoye cemetery uh, in, in Moscow where the, the ash uh, is still there uh, in, in mass graves. Uh, all this was hidden up and all this was kept secretly also to, I think also to, to the Soviet public and no information at all was passed on for decades, even in the thawing period under Khrushchev, uh, the, the, uh, the Austrian government or the families were given false information on the reasons for death. Uh, they just invented uh, different kinds of illnesses why uh, the, the people who were shot dead uh, had passed away. So all this was covered. And now only in, in the last couple of years, it has become possible to get access to the files uh, 
in, in the Moscow archives, in the state archives, and also uh, in, in the archives of the uh, former KGB, uh, the uh, CAFSB. We actually, we published a book, uh, Stefan and, and, and me, a couple of years ago, uh, quite a uh, big book as well, called Stalin's Last Victims uh, that deals uh, with the fate of, of these uh, about 100 uh, Austrians. And not only Austrians, among them were Hungarians as well, who were sentenced in, in Austria. And among them were Soviet uh, Red Army uh, soldiers uh, who were sentenced as well. So uh, it's a very complex uh, and a very tragic and also uh, in a way fascinating uh, topic. Uh, the third question, denazification. Um, the, the Soviet attitude was quite different from the one uh, of, the, of the Western allied powers in, in Austria. Um, this is linked to, to, the, uh, to the attitude uh, of the Soviets towards the Renner uh, government uh, that uh, it established very quickly in April 1945, even before the end of the war, even before uh, the western parts of Austria were even uh, liberated. So there was this, uh, uh, this government under Karl Renner uh, in the Soviet zone. And uh, this is why the Soviets very quickly handed over denazification to the Austrians. And later on, uh, when they saw how, saw how everything developed and that uh, politics in Austria did not develop the way uh, they had hoped for uh, at first, uh, there was a lot of criticism on the way denazification took place uh, by the Austrian government and also uh, by the uh, Western allies, who, for example, had uh, military trials uh, in order to show the, the Austrian uh, public uh, the, the war crimes or other crimes that had been committed uh, by, by Austrians. There also were, by the Westerns, denazification camps. So there was quite a big difference uh, uh, concerning denazification between the Western zones or Western zone and, and the Soviet uh, zone in general. Okay, very good. Thank you, Barbara. Let me, um, before uh, turning to the other participants, what I'm going to do, because we're running short of time, so I'm going to direct questions that have come in for each person, and then we'll give each person a chance to um, contribute on that or on other topics um, that have come up. So let me first, for uh, Walter, um, here is a question that deals with the Marshall Plan and its impact on, uh, because Austria is, was a recipient of, the, of Marshall Plan aid, how did that work out at a time when Austria was divided, particularly for the portion under Soviet occupation? And um, not only because of the inherent difficulties and complexities, but also because there was legislation in the United States um, the Battle Act specifically, the condition USA to particular countries on not uh, be trading with the Soviet bloc. And so um, if you could comment on some of the intricacies of the Marshall Plan in occupied Austria. Um, for Vladimir, a question that um, has come up is where did the Soviet Union acquire its German speaking experts that were deployed to uh, both Austria and Germany. Um, this is um, something that has been discussed at length in both German and Russian. And so if you could condense that into a relatively manageable period of time, Vladimir, um, I realize it's a big topic, including your own university, MGMO, has been among the um, universities training such people. Um, th then uh, question, um, for Stefan, there are, there are a couple, including the questions that Barbara addressed pertaining to the occupation, but there's this, this interesting one that uh, came up, uh, Stefan. I'd be curious to find out whether you have um, gathered information about it. The uh, questioner, George Leopard, um, says during the uh, Soviet occupation of Austria, a few US soldiers, including one officer, defected to the Soviet side. Um, have you come across any 
documents or files pertaining to these people, not only US soldiers, but other foreign soldiers who defected to the Soviet side. Um, and uh, either in GARF or in uh, the Ministry of Defense archive, did you come across um, any materials pertaining to such people? And um, another question, uh, this is from Twisty Putine. I'm just guessing at the pronunciation. I apologize if I mispronounced it. Is um, uh, were Austrian citizens able to complain openly about Soviet abuses and atrocities? Um, did they have any recourse, or were they forced to remain silent? This is a question also that I'll come back to Barbara about. Um, and then uh, finally, there is a question about that I will deal with myself very quickly at the end, which pertains to um, after Soviet, uh, oh, okay, actually, before I get to that one, there's one other, um, after Soviet, this is for uh, perhaps Barbara for Stefan, um, after Soviet troops left, did the region uh, that had been under Soviet occupation essentially assimilate with the others and did the regions of Austria develop particular identities after in light of the occupation or did they become more homogeneous, including on such things as cultural matters, not just politics, but cultural matters um, and, and perhaps uh, Walter can comment on the economic dimension of that as well. Um, then there is one final question that I'll come back to at the end, which pertains to why Austria, why yeah, the Soviet Union accepted Austria's emergence as a capitalist de uh, democratic country. But we have very little time, so I will turn quickly to each participant to deal with any particular aspect of this that you want to with, but don't feel obliged to cover everything. So please vault it for us. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Austria, uh, the Marshall Plan was very, very important for Austria. Austria received the second highest allocations per ca uh, capita after Norway, uh, but the Soviet zone remained uh, excluded from the Marshall Plan. Also in another way, um, the Marshall Plan, as it won't cause damage for the um, Soviet companies, because uh, in Austria, the market economy took hold. And uh, USIA, in, especially USIA, in particular, could not keep up with the dynamics of plants in Western Austria. Um, uh, also, the SMV had major pro problems with uh, its refineries, which were outdated, and the enterprises lacked liquidity. Yes, they uh, remained excluded from the, from the Marshall Plan. USIA SMV and generally the Soviet zone. And uh, also the integration into the Comic-Con economic area was fully coordinated. So uh, from this point of view, uh, the Marshall Plan was, uh, was, was really was quite important for, for Austria. Okay, very good. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Stefan. Thank you so much for the questions. First, I, uh, I come back to the resistance. In, in, uh, we have the evidence that in Austria, uh, where uh, around 100,000 people in resistance, and uh, it means 1.5 percent. This is at at all, and there are some differences between the beginning of, of the of the after the Anschluss and at the end, as uh, Barbara mentioned. Secondly. Uh, we have, we, yes, we have a few evidences about the changing of uh, Soviet uh, functionaries, uh, Soviet people uh, to the Western zone. So we have some evidences, but but uh, but this is uh, this is absolutely a a, 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 a team of what is not uh, what we we have. Uh, no research, research uh, at all uh, about this. This is a very complicated thema. Uh, yes, and a third, uh, we uh, certainly we have some differences uh, in the economy between the eastern zone and the western zones, and and this is uh, and the reason is of course the Marshall Plan. Uh, the eastern zone get much, uh, the western zone get much more. 
uh, economic assistance from from the from the United States than the than the Soviet zone. It is also clear. Thank you. In very short. Yeah. Very good. And anyone who wants to look for more of that should can consult Walter's chapter, which deals with that very well. Uh, please, Vladimir. What's what uh, you said? You are muted, Vladimir. Yes, I wish I knew more about this um, German experts sent to the uh, to the West during the war and how and when they and the the German. But two things during come. The occupation come too, but yeah, come to my mind. First of all, uh, during that, at any, at any rate, uh, the German was uh, as a language, as a foreign, was a foreign language number one in the Soviet Union, uh, especially before the war. And secondly, there were many native speakers in uh, in um, Russia, ethnic ethnic Germans, who lived there, uh, and then most of them were deported during the war. But some of them cooperated were used as interpreters, propagandists, spies. So that's, I think, explains it. There, there was another question, Mark, about now how the Soviet side sought, sought out the prisoners of war when they liberated them. The, the, the procedure was rather simple. Stefan uh, uh, referred to infiltration, to filtration camps. So all those captured or liberated were sent to those filtration points where they were separated into two, uh, two main categories, unsuspect, unsuspected uh, and those who were to be punished for the cooperation, suspicious behavior and so forth. I don't have the exact figures at hand, but from my recollection, it was about half of those um, taken were set free and uh, about perhaps one, 10% were executed, uh, mostly back in Russia, back to Russia, and others sent for different terms of imprisonment. That's how it basically works. Okay, thank Here's you, Vladimir. And then uh, final word to uh, Barbara, if you could. We're running out of time, Barbara, so just uh, I, I, you can recommend that people look at the book. But <laughs> yeah, thank you very much also for the interesting questions. Uh, tying up uh, to what Vladimir said on the POWs, I think uh, this is really one of the very, very tragic uh, uh, issues uh, of the Second World War and, and the after war period. The fate of Soviet prisoners of war who were to become the victims of two totalitarian systems who were at the very bottom of, uh, of the hierarchy in, in the Third Reich and who were then by their own fatherland or motherland uh, regarded as traitors to their country and were after the liberation, in many cases uh, sent to Gulag camp and uh, treated accordingly uh, as the example of, uh, of the relative of yours uh, also shows in a very tragic way. Uh, concerning uh, the question, was it possible to complain about the Red Army? In the Western zone, yes. In the Eastern zone, in the, in the Soviet zone, I think uh, this was something that was not very uh, uh, recommended uh, for. So if, uh, if yes, then in a rather subtle way, like newspapers, if newspapers wrote about uh, misbehavior of Red Army soldiers, they did not write Red Army soldiers did this and that, but they wrote uh, like uh, persons in military clothes and everyone knew, of course, uh, who they were writing about. Uh, the question about uh, about the two zones and whether they, uh, the eastern and, and the western zones, became homogeneous again after 1955, and how how long it uh, it took. This was quite a process uh, that took quite some time, and this is linked to uh, the. Uh, economic uh, development, uh, particularly the Marshall Plan on the one hand side, uh, as mentioned before, and also the exploitation of the economy uh, in the Soviet zone of occupation. So there was this drifting apart between uh, East and West uh, in Austria uh, uh, on, the, on this economic level. And also culture, of course, uh, each of the uh, occup occupying uh, powers uh, sort of 
um, they brought their own culture to their own zone. And um, I, I think that the American way of life, this kind of coca colonization, as it was also called, was probably uh, the most popular among uh, the Austrian population. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. Let me uh, just um, once again share the the uh, image of the book cover. And um, for anyone, the two two editors of the book, Stefan Karner and Barbara Stelzen Marx, have been here. A contributor of Alta Ibra, who contributed an important chapter on the economic dimensions, has been here. And then uh, Vladimir Pichatnev has contributed his, his excellent commentary on the book, uh, although not directly involved in it, um, was, you know, has provided a really superb overview of it. But very quickly, last point, um, one person asked about how Austria subsequent to the occupation emerged as a capitalist democracy, even though much of it already was. Um, but uh, so th let me just very quickly, there is another book that came out just this year that deals with that. So if you want to explore that topic, um, just get a hold of that book as well. And they um, let me then end today's uh, today's seminar, uh, thanking everyone um, for taking part, and also Penny Skelnick and uh, Danielle Valna for uh, having organized it, and to Peter Rugenthaler who gave me the idea to hold it in the first place. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye for now. <laughs>